So if I were to ask you what the most important day of your life is, what would you say? What would you say? Your first communion? Okay. Your baptism? Okay. Wow, you guys are a very holy crowd. This is good. <laughs> uh, any other any other ideas? The birth of your there you go. Yeah, that's a, that's a lot of the answers. Your birthday. I would propose to you that actually the most important day of your life is the day you go to mass. Because the mass really is the most important thing we can do on this side of eternity. The catechism tells us, paragraph 1324, that the Eucharist is the source and the summit of the entire Christian life. And so, yes, your baptism ontologically changes you, but it changes you particularly to bring you into the fullness of communion with Christ in the Blessed Sacrament in his body and blood. So as to offer yourself as a perfect sacrifice to the Father. And so it might not seem like it. I say Mass every day, sometimes two, sometimes three times a day. And let me tell you, it doesn't feel like every Mass I celebrate is the most important thing we do on planet Earth. But it is. And so that's the mindset we have to have um, when we come to Mass. Because we're really going to meet heaven on Earth. And even our churches are set up in such a way to reveal that. So... The priest, when he comes in, he walks down the aisle because he's going somewhere, right? And where is he going? He's going up into the sanctuary, which is the sign of heaven, where heaven meets earth. And a lot of the architecture, including your church here, for the ancients, what was circular was used to represent what was heavenly or what was divinity, okay? And what was squared is what represents the world or the, the earthly realm, and so when you have the circle, so the apse, that's where the tabernacle, that's where the altar is, where that meets the squared part of the church, that's where divinity is meeting humanity. And traditionally, that's where they would have the altar rail, because that's where our humanity would meet divinity there. So that's what's going on when we go to Mass. So before we even get started, though, the priest wears funny things. Um, so does anybody know what this was? Can I take your order? Um, it is not an apron, though it looks like one, yes. Um, so this is actually called an amice, okay, A-M-I-C-E. And in ancient times, they would wear these things over their head under their, soldiers would wear this under their helmets. Um, and so this is what they would wear under their helmets. Um, so the prayer that actually goes with this is, Lord, set on me the helmet of salvation, to fend off all the assaults of the enemy, or the devil. Okay, so this wraps around here like this. One of the things I'll tell you, they don't teach you this in seminary. They actually don't teach you how to put any of this stuff on. So if you get ordained, and they're like, go figure it out. Um, <clears throat> so this here, does anyone know what this is called? Flannel? <laughs> Not the chasuble. I heard it over here. Alb. A-L-B. Uh, an A-L-B, Alb, is a fancy word. Anybody have an idea what that means? It's very technical. It means white. <laughs> All right? So the Alb is simply the white garment. Um, like if you think of albino, right? It's white. Um, so the Alb is white. And what do you think this is symbolic of? You want to put on, what's that? Purity, sure. Um, it's actually our baptismal garment. It's a sign of our baptismal garment. So when we were baptized, we were made into a royal nation and a holy priesthood. Um, so this is actually taking, uh, taking my baptismal priesthood on, um, which is also why altar servers a lot of times will wear white um, because they've been baptized. And if you look in the book of Revelation, they sit around the throne, the altar, clothed in white. Okay, so it's a heavenly reality. The next one. And the prayer that goes with this one is a prayer for purity, being made white in the blood of the Lamb. This guy here. Cincture, that's right. This is a cincture. Sometimes C-I-N-C-T-U-R-E. So this is a cincture. I better move my mic. It's not getting muffled under there. Yeah. There we go. We'll, uh, we'll put this on in just a second. So the cincture here, 
goes around like this. This is one of the things they really need to teach you in seminary. I remember the first time I was putting this on, my mom's like, how did you figure out how to do that? I was like, oh, good question. Okay. And the prayer that goes with the cincture is a prayer for chastity. So you could actually say this is my chastity belt. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This. I kiss it. Cool. And you know why you kiss it? Because I love my job. <laughs> you kiss the stole because you love your job. And this goes here. Now, the stole is a sign of priestly authority. So in ancient Rome, this is what um, they would wear. Senators and such is a sign of their authority in their office. So a priest wears his like this. How does the deacon wear his? Yeah, a deacon wears his across his chest like that. And then the last garment we wear is this guy. Anybody know this one? Not a cassock. A cassock is the black dress. Okay, the cassock is the black dress, um, which is worn as priests in kind of regular clothes. So this is called, I heard it earlier. It is a vestment. All of these things are vestments, though. Starts with a C, rhymes with casual. Chasuble. There you go. All right. So this is a chasuble. I'll put my mic back on here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and if you'll notice, this chasuble is cut a little differently. A lot of times they're a little longer, which would they call a gothic cut. Um, this is what would they call a St. Philip Neri cut. So it's cut back a little bit. St. Philip Neri, uh, Roman saint. And then they also have Roman chasubles, which are even narrower. So you might see those sometimes. The reason I like these is twofold. One, it's less cloth. It's cooler. Secondly, it has this little V here, which your mic sits in perfectly. So there you go. All right, so we're going into Mass. We're going to the altar. As we approach the altar, uh, it's customary we bow to the altar, or if the tabernacle is there, we genuflect. But once Mass starts, what is the center of Mass? Is it the altar or the tabernacle? The altar. It's actually the altar. Yet during the Eucharistic assembly, uh, the main center is the altar. And in fact, some of the prayers for Mass will call the altar as Christ, Christ the altar. Um, so the altar is the sign of Christ during the liturgy. So the priest will come forward. If the tabernacle is there, he'll genuflect on his way in. But that's really the last time unless he goes to get the Blessed Sacrament out that he'll genuflect towards the tabernacle. The rest of the Mass, uh, he bows towards the altar. So the priest would bow towards the altar. He comes around and then what does he do? He kisses the altar. Yep. Now, why do you think the priest would kiss the altar here? What's going to happen here? Yeah, the sacrifice. So the sacrifice, which recapitulates Christ's sacrifice on Calvary, is going to take place here. So yes, this is holy ground, uh, and it's a sign that we're entering directly into that. So... A lot of times in place of what we call the entrance antiphon. Has anybody heard the entrance antiphon? Okay, so the entrance, there's an entrance antiphon and there's actually a communion antiphon. And these are actually in the Missal. They're actually part of the Mass. But a lot of times we omit them and we use a hymn instead. Okay, a hymn as the priest is walking in. But perhaps at daily Mass, I don't know if you guys use the antiphons at daily Mass. Yeah. So you would know it from daily mass. So the first antiphon, it could either be chanted or just recited. The priest would say the antiphon. So the one from this past Sunday, as for me in justice, I shall behold your face. I shall be filled with the vision of your glory. Okay. I forgot to mention, how many colors does the priest wear? So this one's green. So green, when do we use green? Ordinary time, which purple or violet, if you want to be technical. Advent and Lent. Also, um, rose we use in the middle for Laetare Sunday and Gaudete Sunday. Like it's a mixture between white and violet because Easter and Christmas are coming. So those blend together and give us the rose. So we have 
What else? Red, when do we use red? Pentecost, what else? The martyrs. That's right. Pentecost and martyrs. And then we also have one more. White. And when would we use white? We use it for Christmas and Easter. Okay, so white is the festive color. Uh, white's the celebratory time. We also use it for saints who weren't martyrs. So today, does anyone know who Saint Day is today? I think it's the greatest name we have in the calendar. Does anybody know? Camillus de Lillis. Okay. So Camillus de Lillis, he founded hospitals, um, worked in hospitals, uh, but it's his feast today. He wasn't a martyr, so today we wore white for him. Okay. You can also wear gold or silver. Um, those take the place of white. Funerals, you can also actually wear. So you, sometimes you wear white. There's also two other colors that you can use for funerals, which a lot of people don't know. Any guesses? Black? Yep. You can wear black, which is a sign of mourning. And actually, I, when I do most funerals, the people who come typically do wear black. Um, so that seems fitting. There's one more color. Purple or violet. And actually, the church's preference is purple or violet. Um, and the reason being, think about Lent and Advent. Okay, Lent, penitential, we're sorry for our sins, we're seeking to repent. When we go to meet God, we express our sorrow for our sin. But at the same time, we use it for Advent. And Advent is a season of hope. Yeah, we're looking forward to seeing the Lord. Um, and so it really brings both of those things together. Um, so violet is also a color for funerals. Okay. After this point, the priest typically will go back to his chair. Now, at the altar, sorry, at the sanctuary, there's three really distinct features just about in every church. So we have the altar. Obviously, this is just the table. Um, but we have the altar. And what else do we have up here? Yep, the chair. Okay, the podium where the readings come from. Does anyone know what that's properly called? An ambo. A-M-B-O, that's right. So those are the three particular features. And each one of them is given because of the three offices of Christ. So when you were baptized, did you know what happened to you? I do now. But... <laughs> so when you were baptized, when you were baptized, yes, you became a child of God. Yes, you were washed of original sin. But after you were baptized, the priest took chrism and he anointed you on your head. And he said that you are now a member of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. Okay? And so you share in those threefold offices of Christ as priest, prophet, and king. And so we see those three offices displayed here with the ambo, the altar, and the chair. Okay? So where do you think is used to symbolize the priesthood of Christ? Yeah, the altar. The altar of sacrifice. Exactly. What about Christ the prophet? The ambo, proclaiming the word. Okay? And then the final one, is the chair, which is Christ's kingly office or his governing office. So the priest represents those things in the place of Christ at Mass. So he typically comes to the chair as a sign that he has now assembled the community, and now he's ready to, so to speak, govern the community. And what's the first words the priest says at Mass after the antiphon that actually begin the, the Mass? In, in. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Because we're entering into the mystery of Christ himself, and it is the cross which allowed us to enter into that. So we enter into the mystery of Christ himself. And then what does he say? There's three possible greetings. The Lord be with you. Okay, that's the simplest one. Um, that comes from Ruth in Scripture. It also comes, I think, from First Chronicles. Um, but it's a sign that the assembly is making the one Christ present. So is the priest by himself representative of the whole Christ? No. He represents Christ the head, right? But the head also needs what? The body. And so what's taking place there is the dialogue between the whole Christ. Because the goal of Mass is for the entire Christ, both head and members, head and body, to be united to Christ himself, to offer one sacrifice to the Father. Um, and so that's what's taking place. So the Lord be with you is an indication that, okay, the Lord is now present among his assembly with priest and people. 
There's also two other greetings uh, that a priest will sometimes use. The grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the communion of the Holy Spirit be with you all and with your spirit. Now, here's the one that nobody knows, and whenever I use it, crickets. <laughs> it's grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Has anybody ever heard that one? No. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, nobody respond like, everybody goes to Mass, they know to say it with your spirit, and you drop that one and they're like, but that's directly from St. Paul. That's directly from St. Paul's writings. That's the greeting he always uses. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. So to, I actually like to use that one. It's very scriptural. It's from Paul, and especially when the readings say that. Those are the three greetings. And with your spirit. Yep. And with your spirit. And with your spirit. Yeah. So that's the greeting. And now what takes place after the greeting? The assemblies together, body and head, and now what happens? Yeah, the penitential rite, exactly. So we acknowledge that we are sinners in need of mercy. And so we're going into the throne room of heaven, the holy of holies, the one who is most pure. And so we need to acknowledge, we've been invited, but we need to acknowledge that we are in need of mercy in order to be there. So there's three penitential acts, okay? So the First one, okay, is the confidier, which is a fancy Latin word to say, I confess. So, but before we get to that prayer, the priest says, Brothers and sisters, let us acknowledge our sins and so prepare ourselves to celebrate the sacred mysteries. And then the missal says, we pause. And we take that moment to actually acknowledge our sins. And so during Mass, when the priest pauses, it's not because he forgot what he's going to say next, although he might have. But it's actually a moment to acknowledge our sins and ask the Lord for his mercy. Okay? So we would pause, <clears throat> I don't know, eight seconds. I think is a good time. Eight seconds. So we pause for a brief period of time, acknowledge our sins before the Lord, ask for his mercy, and then we would say, I confess. You guys know that prayer? And then the priest would say the words, they're called the words of absolution. It's different than the words in confession, so this doesn't get you out of serious sin. Uh, if you're in serious sin, we need to confess before Mass. But may Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins, and bring us to everlasting life. Amen. And then each penitential act has the threefold, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy, Kyrie eleison, Christ eleison, Kyrie eleison. And those words were what was used in the Roman system um, when somebody was brought into the judicial system and they were asking for mercy. Um, so those are actually the Roman juridical words asking for mercy. Um, and it's interesting enough, Kyrie eleison, Christe eleison, Kyrie eleison. What language is that? Greek. That's Greek. Yeah, that's Greek. Um, which is kind of odd because the Roman Empire, um, but that's what they use. And actually, like a basilica, before a basilica was a church, it was actually a legal, it was like a courtroom. Um, so that style of church was actually a courtroom before it was um, a church building. Yes? Mm hmm mm hmm It's always been in Greek. I know, so Brian, I think that I'm trying to do, you're getting to Latin America, and of course, I'm on It's Greek. It's Greek. Yeah, it's Greek. Yeah, I mean, depending on where you were. It, it really comes to the Roman legal system. That's really where it comes from. Because even in the Roman legal system, they used Greek in that setting. Um, so that's where that comes from. Um, and then, Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. So that's option one. Option two is what we would call the tropes or the invocations. So the priest would say, you were sent to heal the contrite of heart, Lord have mercy. You came to call sinners. Christ, have mercy. You're seated at the right hand of the Father to intercede for us. Lord, have mercy. And those can be adjusted depending on the day. Uh, the priest has some freedom to say little invocations. I particularly would love to use the one you told that Syrophoenician Phoenician woman she wasn't worthy of the scraps of the table. Lord, have mercy. <laughs> you did not come to bring peace but the sword. Christ, have mercy. So the priest does have some... That's a joke. That's a joke. Uh, 
but the priest does have freedom there. Um, so that's the shortest one. Now the third option, the third option, which no one knows, just like that third greeting that no one knows. Um, have mercy on us, O Lord. For we have sinned against you. Show us, O Lord, your mercy and grant us your salvation. May Almighty God have mercy on us, forgive us our sins. And then the Lord have mercy, Christ have mercy, Lord have mercy. I have a question. Mm -hmm. So I was raised, we always made the sign of the cross mm -hmm. when the priest said, May, May Almighty God have mercy on us. And I, I do it, I spoke to other people, some people that told me in church, but not many, but the priest also is not taking that time. Yeah, it's no longer in the rubrics. Um, I think there was a certain devotion um, that it was absolution, and so that was the the devotion of that. Uh, but it's not currently in the rubrics, so there's no need um, to do that. Some people do it out of piety or whatever, but yeah, it's no longer in there. Um, so a rubric, great question. So a rubric comes from the Latin word for red, ruby. Um, it's the words written in red in the Missal. And those are the priest's instructions. So the colloquial way of saying what a priest should do is say the black, which are the words, and do the red. Okay? Yeah. As my dad says, it's not that hard of a job. You have to read out of a book. Okay, right. thanks, Dad. <laughs> <clears throat> it does. Oh, yeah. Yeah, the prayers each day change. Um, all right, so we've been forgiven of our sins. We've acknowledged our sins. Now, at this point, there's one of two ways. On a Sunday or a, a solemn feast day, uh, we have the glory. Okay, glory to God in the highest, or earth, peace to people of goodwill. That comes from the Gospels, right? The, the seed of Christmas, when the shepherds go, the angels, glory to God in the highest. So that's where we come, giving praise and glory to God on certain festive days that are more celebratory. If not, we go directly into the collect. Now, collect is spelled like collect, but I don't know why we decided to call it a collect. Yeah, yeah. So the collect takes place, and the priest will say, let us pray. And the missile actually tells us at that point, we are to pause. Let us pray. And then everybody's looking at Father like, let's go. But that moment is actually to offer our intention that we brought to Mass. And so the reason it's called the collect is because what the priest is doing in that moment He's collecting, so to speak, all of the intentions of the people to offer them in that prayer. So when the priest says, let us pray, that's the moment for each one of us. What intention have I come to offer to God today? Because um, the priest has a particular one he's been asked to pray for. But so too, when we come to Mass, we need to have a real petition. So it's that moment. Okay, let us pray. And then he says the prayer. So today... Yeah, we would use the one from 15th Sunday of Ordinary Time. Through our Lord Jesus Christ, your Son, who lives and reigns with you in the, Holy, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, God, forever and ever. And you would say, Amen. What does the word Amen mean? You say that all the time. I believe, I agree, I stake my life on this. Um, exactly. So at that point, now what do we do? We sit down to listen to the liturgy of the Word. So that concludes the introductory rites, and now we move into the liturgy of the word. So the first reading in the liturgy of the word typically comes from where? Old Testament. Except if we're in the Easter season, then it comes from the New Testament. Daily Mass, we have one reading, one first reading, Psalm, Gospel. For Sunday Mass, we have two readings, Old Testament, <clears throat> usually one of St. Paul's letters, Psalm, and the, or the Psalms after the Old Testament. The epistle, and then the gospel. Now, lay people typically read the first reading of the first two readings. Um, why is it, do you think, that only a bishop, a priest, or a deacon then comes to read the gospel? Okay, that's part of it. Any other ideas? Yeah, <clears throat> so it dates to the nature of apostolic tradition. So the apostles went, they had encountered Christ, they went and preached the gospel, they went and ordained other men to do what? To go proclaim the gospel. And so both a deacon and a priest have been ordained by a bishop, who was ordained by a bishop, 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 by an apostle. 
So it dates directly to the apostles. And so it is carrying on the apostolic commission to go and to preach the gospel to all nations. And yes, like you said, it is Christ who is proclaiming the gospel. Um, <clears throat> so a couple things that you would never know, but I'm going to tell you. Uh, the priest makes, or the deacon, makes a bow towards the altar, and the prayer he says is, cleanse my heart and my lips, Almighty God, that I may worthily proclaim your holy gospel. Okay, so that's what the priest is supposed to be praying. When he finishes the gospel, and what is he, what's the greeting he uses before the gospel? The Lord be with you, right? Again, because head and members are becoming, this is another high point of the Mass, which the head and the members are listening to God himself speak. At the end of the gospel, the words he says are, through the words of the gospel, may our sins be wiped away. And then what does he do? He kisses it, all right? He venerates it um, as a sign that we venerate the word of God. And actually, the Second Vatican Council says that we venerate the word of God, which is not a book, okay? We venerate the word of God in the same way we venerate the body of our Lord. Okay, so that's the reverence um, that we're to have for sacred scripture. <clears throat> and I heard a priest tell us one time, um, we would never go to Mass and imagine dropping a host or dropping particles of the host and walking away like nothing happened. And he said, it's the same way we need to be delicate with the Scriptures. We need to seek to, to catch every single word um, that is being proclaimed. you want to explain why? Sure. No, it's... Yeah. So... We sign ourselves with the sign of the cross on our head, our lips, and our chest. And there is no official prayer for that. It's not in the Missal, but it is a good custom. May the Lord be in my mind, and on my lips, and in my heart. Okay? So, yes. All right. Then after the gospel has been proclaimed, then what happens? You get your bulletin out, and you start to look at what's going on in the week. Okay? Yeah. Yeah. It's time for the homily. Yeah. And a homily is a really specific kind of preaching. So there's a variety of ways to preach. There's sermons, which which take on a topic, something like that, and kind of seek to teach. But a homily is a kind of mystagogy. Um, so you mentioned RCIA. Does anybody know what that word mystagogy means? Yeah, breaking open the mystery. And so it's that point in the Mass, the priest is stopping to illustrate what is going on here in the mystery. So the sacraments in the early church were called the mysteries. Um, and not in a sense that they're sneaky and we don't know what's going on. But it's so profound, we know a little bit about it, but we don't know the whole thing. Okay, And so we're delving into the mysteries, trying to break them open. So the priest typically will preach on the scripture readings, but... He's also able to preach on anything else that's in the Missal. So I could actually preach on the penitential rite. Okay, we don't typically see that happen. But that time is for the priest to actually preach on the greater mystery that's taking place here at the Mass. And so if you go to um, like an ordination for priests or a confirmation um, or even a wedding, okay, those are also mysteries being celebrated in the greatest mystery. And so the priest can preach on those things as well. Okay, and after that point, now if you have catechumens, this is fascinating. So if you have catechumens, this is actually the point, you guys know what catechumens are, okay, people who have not been baptized but are on their way. Um, it's at this point that the catechumens traditionally would be dismissed, okay? Does anybody know why that would be? It is before the creed, so they've yet to profess the creed. What else do you think? Do you know? Uh, they typically go for some kind of, uh, yeah, so they typically go for that, which is true. So, so remember what baptism did to you, okay? Priest, prophet, and king, right? And so what does a priest do? A priest offers sacrifice. Okay, and as the lay faithful, you too are participating in Christ's priesthood. You participate in his priesthood as the body. I participated in it as the head, but we participate in Christ's one priesthood. And so it's at this place in the Mass 
that we actually begin to offer our prayers, right? Because after the creed, okay, which they've yet to profess, so that's part of it. But after the creed, we have the prayers of the faithful, all right? And that's the moment we begin to exercise our baptismal priesthood because we're praying for our needs and the needs of the church, okay? So that's what's going on there. And so that's why they're not yet invited because they've yet to be ordained to the priesthood of Christ's body, all right? So we have the prayers of the faithful. After that point, any questions so far? We're about halfway through Mass. And Father preached quick today. We're going to get out of here. <clears throat> How long do you think a homily should be? This is always a fun question. 12 minutes. 12, 8? 8? I'll tell you what, I, I, daily Mass, I'm between two and three minutes on the long term. Sunday Mass, <clears throat> Sunday Mass, I shoot for between five and seven because people's attention spans in the modern era end at about seven minutes. So um, that's, that's my school of thought, but there are many schools of thoughts out there, so don't take that as gospel. That is not part of this show. <clears throat> All right, so now the priest will prepare the altar or the altar server. So I have a variety of things here. Um, first, we'll go through the linens. This one, okay, it's got nine squares. Okay, does anybody know what this is? Wow. Are you sack? <laughs> Very good. So why do you think it's called a corporal? When we hear the word corporal, what do we hear in there? Corporal punishment, what kind, of, what kind of punishment is, man, sorry, you must have had a rough childhood. Um, we, we, can we can talk later. Um, but corporal, what kind of punishment is that? Well, physical, exactly, which means body, right? And so the corporal is where the body lays, okay? So the body of Christ lays it on top of this. In the old rite, it would, the sacred host would actually go on the corporal itself. Um, which is why they would use patents like these to scrape up any particles. Um, that's no longer the case. The host stays on the patent now. I just told you what this one's called. So I gave that one away. Um, this one here, purificator. Okay, so this is used to purify the vessels. Okay. What is this? Good, good. You guys are... All right chalice. This is nice. I might take this home. <laughs> and this one here. A ciborium. Yeah, very good. Ciborium. Um, singular. So it's actually a cibori. Ciborium singular. Ciborio would be plural. Yep. Okay. So this is used for the hosts. This is where the, the hosts for the people would be. Um, and sometimes they're shorter. So like the ones we have at St. Vincent's, uh, they don't have the stem. Uh, they stack on each other because we have a lot of them to get in the tabernacle. Um, but that's the ciborium. Okay. <clears throat> Two other things here. Cruets. That's right. Cruets. And then... Towel. That's a hard one. Yep. So. <laughs> and then this is, I mean, you can call it a basin. You can call it a lavabo bowl. Um, but lavabo. L-A-V-A-B-O. Lavabo. Oh, yeah, we didn't get to that one. What do you think this is? Any guesses? This is plastic. This is, that's not biodegradable. Um, so this is called a pall, P-A-L-L. -L. And so you think about a funeral, what do they put over the casket? A pall. They put a pall because it goes over the body. In the same way this is what goes over Christ's blood. Okay. So, and the traditional reason for using the pall, does anybody know why we use this? So nothing falls in it, no bugs get in there. 
um, I was in last November, I was in Honduras um, and there are geckos and there are all kinds of things crawling around there. So, I mean, it's actually a really practical purpose. Okay. <clears throat> so the prayers over the offerings. So the first one, the priest takes the patent and he says the prayer, blessed are you Lord God of all creation. For th this doesn't count by the way. Blessed are you, Lord, God of all creation, for through goodness we have the bread, this bread to offer you, fruit of the earth, and work of human hands to become for us the bread of life. So a couple of things about the, let's be God. Uh, the preference, according to the Missal, is that those prayers are actually said quietly by the priest. Um, he can say them out loud. It's an option. Um, but typically the priest will say those quietly. A lot of times on Sunday Mass, there's usually music going on anyway. Um, but those prayers are actually Jewish table prayers. Um, so they come uh, from the Jewish table prayer. So if anybody's seen The Chosen, has anybody seen The Chosen? Yeah, so blessed are you, Lord God. Of all, they, like it's, they say that prayer frequently throughout the show, um, and that's where those prayers come from. A couple of things to note. Um, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through your goodness we receive the bread we offer you. So recognizing that God has created this, like the, sa the sacrifice we're about to offer, he's already given us. He already owns it. But what happened? Through the work of human hands. So we're participating in that act to offer to God. So it's both a gift from God, but also our work in it. Okay, And I could go deeply into uh, the mystery of bread and wheat. Uh, because this is the Paschal mystery, right? The rising and the, di the dying and the rising. And so wheat, what has to happen? It has to die. Has to, and then it has to be ground. And then it's, yeah, it rises. So it's very, um, on a natural level, sacramental, so to speak. All right. The next thing the priest will do is he prepares the chalice. And he says, by the mystery of this water and wine, may we come to share in the divinity of Christ, who humbled himself to share in our humanity, which is a beautiful prayer. It's at that point we're recognizing the mystery of the incarnation, that God himself decided to take on our human flesh. And so... Wine, which is symbolic of divinity, joy, and the ordinariness of water, those two things are commingled here. Historically, the reason for that is the wine in Rome was so bad, seriously, uh, that they had to dilute it. So that's where that comes from. Um, blessed are you, Lord God of all creation, for through goodness we receive the wine we offer you. Again, fruit of the earth, thank you, Lord, work of human hands to become our spiritual drink. And then at this point, you wouldn't hear this prayer typically, but the priest says he bows, asking God to accept the sacrifice. With humble spirit and contrite heart, may we be accepted by you, O Lord, and may our sacrifice in your sight this day be pleasing to you, Lord God. And that comes from Daniel. That's the book of Daniel, um, a prayer for mercy on, on behalf of the people. So remember, the priest is offering on behalf of the people. So he's asking for God's mercy there. And then at this point, he washes his hands. And he says, wash me, O Lord, from my iniquity and cleanse me from my sin. Okay, so he would do that. Historically, I'm sure that was probably a hygienic thing. Um, but it's taken on the meaning of purifying our hands before we offer sacrifice. Now, here is the point in the Mass. Um, in 2011, they changed the translation. I don't know if you remember that. Pray now that our sacrifice may be acceptable to God. And now it's pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours. And so it really is drawing out that we both have a sacrifice to offer. I'm offering in the person of Christ the head. You're offering in the person of Christ the body. But it's one sacrifice. And so pray, brothers and sisters, that my sacrifice and yours may be acceptable to God, the Almighty Father. For the praise and glory of his name, for our good and good of all of his holy church. Okay, next the priest makes the prayer over the offerings. Um, so these change each day. Each day, so the collect, the prayer we have at the chair at the beginning, and then the prayer over the offerings, then also the prayer after communion. Those change each day depending on what Mass we're celebrating. Those are what we would call the propers. Okay. All right, and then after the prayer over the offerings, the priest says, the Lord be with you which is always our signal that something important is about to happen. We do it at the beginning, we do it at the gospel, and now we do it again here, right? Because what's going on here is we've actually properly started the Eucharistic prayer. 
The preface begins the Eucharistic prayer, and it starts with the sacrifice of praise. Okay, so the preface dialogue in the preface is a sacrifice of praise, leading us into the sacrifice of the bread and wine, uh, which becomes Christ's body and blood. Um, so we say that prayer, and then we end every preface with the holy, holy, holy. Okay, does anybody know where that comes from? What's that? Yeah, exactly. Okay, so all the elders sit around the throne and with the angels and the saints singing, holy, holy, holy. Um, Isaiah also has this vision in the temple, the, the threefold holy. And so for the Hebrews, they didn't have uh, superlative words. So good, better, best. Um, in order for something to be the best, they would just say it three times. So it'd be good, 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 right? And so that's why we would say most holy or holiest. But traditionally for the Hebrews, they would say holy, holy, holy. So that's where we're getting that. It's a beautiful sign. Um, it says, therefore, we extol you with all the angels in joyful celebration. Or sometimes it'll say with the seraphim and the cherubim. Okay, that's a sign that what we're about to do here is actually participating in the reality which is going on right now in heaven. Who the heck are we? You know? And so after the preface, we move into the Eucharistic prayer. Now here is Catholic trivia for you. How many Eucharistic prayers are in the Roman Missal? Four? So before, before the Vatican, Second Vatican Council, before the liturgical reforms, there was really one. Uh, that was the Roman canon, which is still Eucharistic prayer number one. And so that's to you, therefore, most merciful Father, and that's all the saints. Linus, Cletus, Clement, Clement. All right. All right. So that's the traditional one, which comes from the ancient Roman liturgy. Um, so that's what they would have used in ancient Rome. But there's also uh, <clears throat> three other what I would call ordinary ones. So there's four primary Eucharistic prayers. And they have really fancy names. Ready for this? Eucharistic prayer one, Eucharistic prayer two, Eucharistic prayer three, and Eucharistic prayer four. Okay. Um, two is the shortest. That's the one like the dew fall. Okay. So that one's often used when Father preaches too long. And people are getting, yeah, you got to move things along. Um, but the imagery of the dew fall is beautiful because, do you know what it comes from? Precisely. That's exactly where it comes from. Yeah, like the dewfall, the manna in the desert. Um, <clears throat> Eucharistic prayer three. Um, it's really beautiful. Uh, <clears throat> the line, by the power and work of the Holy Spirit, you give life to all things and make them holy. And you never cease to gather a people to yourself. So that from the rising of the sun to its setting, a pure sacrifice may be offered to your name. And what that language is coming from is actually the prophet Malachi who prophesies that there will be a priest who will come and offer the perfect sacrifice. And so that's actually fulfilling Malachi's prophecy there. Um, my favorite Eucharistic prayer actually happens to be four. Okay, so four actually goes through the whole of salvation history. Um, so it's like the entire biblical overview of salvation history. It's a little longer, um, but I do love Eucharistic prayer four. Um, but you don't hear it very often because the preface isn't interchangeable. So you have to use this specific preface. So basically, you only use it on a Sunday in ordinary time or a weekday that doesn't have a proper preface. So you don't hear it very often. But turns out there's actually six other Eucharistic prayers. So there's the four major ones which we're familiar with. Um, there's two Eucharistic prayers for reconciliation. Um, so a lot of times, if you hear those, it's typically during a purple season. A penitential season, so Advent or Lent. Um, there's also various, there's four various needs. You have pressure on Father Francis. They're going to start asking you. I'm, I'm telling them all the secrets in the book. Um, the, the ones for various needs are actually a little shorter. Um, but so various needs one, the church on the path of unity. Two, God guides his church along the way of salvation. Uh, the third various needs is Jesus, the way to the Father. My favorite one in its title is various needs for Jesus who went about doing good, which makes me think of like Jesus with a lady getting a cat out of a tree, helping an old lady across the street, 
Like that's what very, he went about doing good. Um, okay. So all the Eucharistic prayers. Okay. So we get into the words of the consecration. How are we doing on time here? Okay, we're moving. <clears throat> so a couple things about the actual Eucharistic prayer. So the priest consecrates uh, the body of Christ separately from the blood of Christ. Does anybody know why that would be? What's the symbolism taking place there? That's a good idea. That's a good thought. So it's actually, in the, for the ancients, when you separated the flesh from the blood, was a sign of death okay so the host would be consecrated and then the precious blood would be consecrated as a sign that the body and blood have now separated okay because we always say mass is the representation of calvary which includes christ's death it's also the representation of the entire paschal mystery it's not just the suffering and death of christ which we'll get to okay so he consecrates both of those and what does he do after he consecrates both elements Genuflex. And <clears throat> so this is actually really the sacrificial symbolism that's taking place at the Mass. Um, because you can go to a communion service, or if you think about going to Good Friday service, those aren't Masses, right? Why not? What, what distinguishes them? There hasn't been a sacrifice. We're taking the elements that were consecrated previously. So this is the actual sacrifice taking place. Um, so they're now separated. The priest genuflex in adoration of the Lord. Um, <clears throat> and then after that, the priest says the mystery of faith, right? Um, because now we're professing the totality of our belief here in the, the sacrificed elements. So there's three options. When we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim your death, O Lord, until you come again. Save us, Savior of the world, for by your cross and resurrection you have set us free. And the one that has been there uh, traditionally, the one that we've had the longest, we proclaim your death, O Lord, and profess your resurrection until you come again. And those words, actually, the priest is not supposed to say. A lot of times he leads it, otherwise the congregation would be confused. Um, but those are really the, the, that's really the offering of the people. Um, so it's really their prayer that they are to take advantage of. Exactly. Yeah, just practically. But that is the, that's really the prayer of the people. A um, couple things about the priest's position. When he has his hands out, it's a sign that he's praying for the people, on behalf of the people. When he has his hands together, he's praying with the people. Okay, so just a couple slight things there. Um, and then every Eucharistic prayer ends with the doxology. So <clears throat> at this point, so really this is the high point of the Mass. Okay. Through him and with him and in him, O God, Almighty Father, in the unity of the Holy Spirit, all glory and honor is yours forever and ever. Amen. And so the priest says that, and the amen is a response to what the priest is doing. So it's both the priest and the people offering together. Um, and why do I call that the high point of the Mass? Because why do we go to Mass? It's not to receive the Eucharist. It's not. Yeah, this is a mystery of the universe, huh? Yeah, now receiving the Eucharist certainly is important. Um, but we go to Mass primarily to worship God, right? And so this is the act of worship. Um, on our own, is it possible to worship God fully and perfectly? No. Only Christ can do that. Only the perfect man who's taken on our humanity can do that. And so <clears throat> our offering is united to Christ in this, uh, where we offer it to the Father. So the Eucharistic prayer, who is the Eucharistic prayer addressed to? The Father. Yeah, exactly. Um, and a lot of people don't actually recognize that. Uh, the Eucharistic prayer is addressed to the Father, and this is the moment we actually are making that offering to the Father. So I'm not a chanter. I don't have a great voice. But that is the one part of the Mass I chant because it is the most... Uh, important as a whole body. Our participation in Holy Communion uh, is the realization of that. Um, so our participation in Holy Communion is primarily in order for us to worship God um, by being configured to Christ. But the end of being configured to Christ is the worship of God. 
Um, we've kind of lost that, I feel like, in our modern world. Um, but that's, that's, yeah, but that's, that's what we're doing. What's that? Yes. Yeah, so the moment of consecration, this is my body, which will be given up for you. So at that point, uh, that is the body of Christ during Mass. This is my blood, and when the chalice is elevated, yep. Exactly, precisely. Um, <clears throat> so the elements go down. At that point, now remember what we just did there. We offered ourselves, broken as we are, to the Father in Christ. And now what's the next thing that happens? We say the Our Father. Okay, so now we are actually saying the Our Father as reconciled children in Christ, um, which is really beautiful. Uh, we've offered to the Father, and now the Father has welcomed us into, uh, into intimacy with Him, and so truly we can say the Lord's Prayer, the words of Jesus Himself, because we are acting now in Christ Himself. So we say the Lord's Prayer, uh, and then there's a little deliverance prayer. It's called an embolism, which I think, isn't that a heart thing? Like you have an embolism? So I, I don't know why they use that word, but yeah. yeah. So anyways, uh, deliver us, O Lord, in the coming of our Savior, Jesus Christ. People reply, for the kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours now and forever. So we've entered into the throne room, and now we're singing the glory of God who sits upon the throne. The kingdom, the power, and the glory are yours. And then we get into the sign of peace. Now, the sign of peace is an interesting phenomenon. So <clears throat> some people, and even when the liturgical reforms were taking place, they proposed that we would put the sign of peace before we bring the gifts to the altar. Because if you remember the gospel story, if you're at enmity with your brother, go and reconcile first and then bring your gift to the altar. Um, so that's a, a fitting idea. <clears throat> but the, the Roman custom and St. Augustine talks about this. The sign of peace was to seal a covenant. Okay, So the covenant with the Father, we've all become one family in the covenant of love with the Father. And now we share that sign of peace with each other as a sealing of that covenant. That now we are truly brothers and sisters because we have the same Father. Okay, And if, you, if you've ever been to a, an ordination of a priest or a deacon, okay, after they're ordained, so a deacon gets ordained, what happens? All the other deacons come and give him the sign of peace. Okay, same thing for a priest. After he's ordained, all the other priests come and give him the sign of the peace, saying that now we, we share in one. Um, so the sealing of the covenant. Now here's the fascinating part, which you would never see. I'm showing you all the inside things. <clears throat> um, during the sign of peace, so you're usually like, so when I come in to help with communion, when somebody else is saying mass, I walk down the aisle, the sign of peace is taking place, and I just hear <laughs> everywhere. I'm like, come on, people. Um, <laughs> But uh, I'm glad you're laughing at my jokes. I appreciate that. Um, but yeah, it's really funny because yeah, the music hasn't started. <clears throat> but at this point, it's called the fractio rite. F-R-A-C-T-I-O. Fractio, which means fraction. Uh, to break, to fracture, right? So the fractio rite. So at this point, the priest takes the bread. And the, the early church, they called the Eucharist the breaking of the bread. Okay. So the priest would take the host and he breaks it in half and he takes one particle and he places the particle in the chalice. Okay. And the prayer he says while he's doing that is, may this mingling of the body and blood of our Lord Jesus Christ bring eternal life to us who receive it. Okay. Now, what do you think is taking place here symbolically? The resurrection. Precisely. So the body and blood have now come back together. Okay, so this is the moment of resurrection. And it's quite beautiful. I just realized this the other day. When Christ rises from the tomb, who was there to see it? No one. Right? No one was there to see it. And so the Father himself is the only one who gets to see it. And so as a priest, I find it very beautiful that I get to sacramentally see that moment. Um, and sacramentally, his body and blood come back together. Okay? So this is the moment of the resurrection during this Paschal Mystery Reality. And during that time, what do we begin to sing? Lamb of God. Do we ever sing the Agnus Dei? 
it's the same words. Just different languages. Um, yeah. He yeah. said, so the Agnus Dei, the Lamb of God, the same thing. And during that, <clears throat> the priest has his own private prayers. So at this point, the priest is actually given the prayers to pray for his own personal communion here. So I'll, I'll share those with you since you don't ever hear them. The first one, Lord Jesus Christ, Son of the living God, who by the will of the Father and the work of the Holy Spirit, through your death, gave life to the world. Free me by this most holy body and blood from all my sins and from every evil. Give me always faith those commandments and never let me be parted from you. And then the other one, may the receiving of your body and blood, Lord Jesus Christ, not bring me to judgment and condemnation, but through your loving mercy, be for me protection in mind and body and a healing remedy. You genuflex. Now the host would be broken at this point. <clears throat> and what does he say here? Behold the Lamb of God. Behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. Now what is, there's a lot going on in that phrase. That is, personally as a priest, that's my favorite part of the Mass, actually. Um, I have a huge devotion to John the Baptist. So <clears throat> those are the words that John the Baptist says as Christ is walking by the Jordan. Behold the Lamb of God. And what is that referring to, Lamb of God? Very good. Thanks. You have got well-catechized people here, Father. Because a lot of times people are like, Jesus is like a gentle little lamb. <laughs> um, no, the lamb of sacrifice. Think back to Exodus. They slaughtered the lamb and put the blood of the door on the doorposts. Um, he is the pa true Paschal lamb who passes over from death into life. So, it's John's words, Behold the Lamb of God, behold him who takes away the sins of the world. Blessed are those called to the supper of the Lamb. So the supper of the Lamb language, what is that referring to? Uh, perhaps there is some imagery there, but I'm thinking later in the scriptures. Precisely, the book of Revelation. The Lamb who was once slain sits upon the throne uh, in glory, and it's a wedding feast of the Lamb. So it's actually a wedding feast. So this past Saturday, I, I had a wedding, and I told the bride and the groom, I have some surprising news for you. This is not the first time you walk down that aisle on your wedding day. And they were like, what? Because this is the true wedding feast of the Lamb, where Christ in his divinity marries our humanity, and the two become one here in flesh and blood. And so, quite literally, uh, when we go to Mass, it is, so to speak, our wedding day. It's a participation in the one unending wedding day of heaven. Um, so I love that moment, especially because John, one of his other, John the Baptist, one of his other titles, he's the friend of the bridegroom or the best man. And he's the one who, what's the best man do? He prepares a marriage between the bride and the groom. Okay? And that's what John's doing right here. At the, it's, it's awesome! I love my job. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Yeah, my dad's a dandy. Um, but I should say, at this moment, behold the Lamb of God. Okay, so remember Christ crucified, body and blood separated, the fractio, right? They've been brought back together, sign of the resurrection. Now the species are elevated into the heavenly reality. Behold the Lamb of God. Okay, what is that a sign of? Ascension. Okay, Christ has gone to his heavenly glory. Now he sits upon the throne as a lamb once slain. <clears throat> um, comes time for Holy Communion. There's also a communion antiphon uh, that can be used if a hymn isn't sung. So we have the communion antiphon. The priest receives. So the priest has to receive both elements. He can't just receive one or the other. Um, and they have to be the ones that are sacrificed here at the Mass. Um, so... The only time that gets confusing is if you have a con celebrating priest, and sometimes somebody will bring the tabernacle hosts out. Um, so the priest can't actually consume the tabernacle hosts validly to offer the mass because he has to offer what was he has to consume what was offered. Okay. All right, time for holy communion comes. Priest comes down. Now, what's going on here? <clears throat> Christ has ascended to heavenly glory, and now his body and blood are being dispersed. What do you think that could be a sign of? Sure. What, what empowered the apostles to proclaim the gospel? When did the Holy Spirit come? 
Precisely. Precisely. So, tongues of fire be pretty cool. You know what else would be pretty cool? Christ himself. <laughs> right? And so, we receive the fullness of the Spirit when we receive Christ. And so, when we receive Holy Communion, that really is our moment to ask for the grace of Pentecost, to be filled with the fullness of Christ's Spirit, um, that his Spirit would become ours. So, we receive Holy Communion. We've lived the Pentecost reality. Now all the elements come back together. Now the priest purifies the vessels. So this isn't just simple dishwashing up here. Um, colloquially, people are like, hey, you got a napkin and you're doing dishes. and Like, no, these are actually sacred things. So why do you think priests, um, so what a priest would do, he would put water into the ciborium. The water from the ciborium goes into the chalice. He scrapes off whatever particles are left on here, and then everything is consumed. Why do you think the priest takes time to do that? Um, exactly. So I had uh, a friend of mine, he was a Lutheran pastor, um, who eventually became Catholic. But while he was a Lutheran pastor, because uh, his congregation, they believe in the true presence. Um, and so after their liturgy was over, after their services were done, they would take whatever hosts were left over, whatever bread was left over, and they would put it in Tupperware and throw it in the sacristy in a different place from the stuff that wasn't consecrated. And he was like, if this is really Jesus, why are we doing that? And so he, I mean, that was one of the reasons he was convicted, like, there's something off here. Um, so the reason is because every particle is, as long as it retains the, um, the accidents of bread and wine, uh, the presence remains. So we want to be careful, um, make sure everything goes in, uh, the chalice and is consumed. And the prayer that we say with that is, um, so you wouldn't hear this, but the prayer the priest says, or the deacon or the acolyte, um, what is past our lips is food, O Lord. May we possess in purity of heart that what has been given to us in time may be our healing for eternity. Okay. So everything gets cleaned up. Um, I think there's probably some un unexciting reasons for that. Um, when COVID happened and there wasn't altar servers, you started to see the table just being here. Um, so there's no strict provision. Um, it can be either way. But a lot of... Um, what do you mean? I'm not following. Yeah, there's really only three. Yeah, there's only three persons uh, who can properly purify the vessels. So a priest, well, a priest or a bishop or a deacon, or there's actually another person known as an acolyte. Okay, so there's actually instituted ministries within the church. So the ministry of acolyte, um, they can also purify the vessels, but they would purify them away from the altar at what we would call the credence table. Okay, that's what that's called. <clears throat> okay. You have a question? It does happen. Yeah, it's called a patent. Yeah, great question. Great question. So if a host falls, uh, the missile says that we are to pick it up and consume it reverently. Uh, that's that's all really the instruction the missile gives. Um, now, a couple other situations that could happen. It goes into somebody's mouth. They're sick. They chew. 
they spit it back up. Okay, this does happen. Um, what would happen? Um, a priest would take the host. Uh, he would put it in a chalice of water, and he would allow it to dissolve because once the accidents of the bread and wine cease, uh, it is no longer uh, Christ's body and blood. Okay, so they would dissolve. So this actually. Um, some of the Eucharistic miracles, there was a host that was discarded. They found it in the back of the church. The priest put it in water in a, put it in the tabernacle for it to dissolve. And it didn't dissolve, uh, but it actually uh, began to show blood. Yeah. So that does happen. Um, so that would be, <clears throat> but, and then I would recommend, uh, just as a pious practice, um, if a host does fall in here, you guys will have your own protocol, but I think it's a pious practice um, to take a purificator, so an extra purificator, uh, put some water on it, and wipe the spot in case there are any particles um, that might have fallen. So I think that's a good practice to do. Um, and even if like you don't see any, any of the particles, um, it's just good reverence to give to the Lord. So, okay, communion is over. We're done. Let's sit down. Father's thinking about where he's golfing this afternoon. Um, and then he stands up. Yeah, I'll, I'll have time for questions. We're almost, we're almost to the final blessing. Um, so final blessing, let us pray. He says the final prayer. Um, there could be a blessing. Um, and then he would say, may the Lord be with you. Okay, so now what's happening? The Great Commission. Yep, it's another. So we've we've had... Calvary. I mean, we've had the Last Supper. We've had Calvary. We've had the Resurrection. We've had the Ascension. We've had Pentecost. And now, once you've received the Spirit, what are you supposed to do? Go out and share. So, um, <clears throat> there's four dismissals. So, uh, the most boring one. Go forth. The Mass is ended. <laughs> Thanks, Father. Okay. Go in peace. Go in peace, glorifying the Lord by your life, and go and announce the gospel of the Lord. I tend to like that one. Um, but all four of those are legitimate uh, dismissals. You all say, thanks be to God, and then you go do the work of the kingdom. When I was a kid, this is a funny story. When I was a kid, um, <clears throat> we said, thanks be to God. I used to always think we were saying, thanks, speedy God. <laughs> like, thank you for finally getting us out of here. Um, so... Yeah, yeah. Watch out if you're if you're a rascal kid, you'll be spending the rest of your life. Um, yeah, and then the the prayer of Saint Michael, which is the custom in our diocese, so uh, it's a great prayer. Um, uh, most of the churches in our diocese do, but that's not a universal. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I was in Baltimore for the last six years when I was in seminary, and we said it out there too. So, I mean, a lot of places do say it, but it's a it's a private prayer. It's not actually part of the mass. Um, 